welcome to the Science and Beers podcast with me, Michael McGee. Talking science and drinking beers with researchers down at the pub. So join us with a brew and let's cheers to science. This week, we're going on a journey to the Arctic and the Antarctic with Dr. Carl Attard. We're going to hear what it's like to visit the North Pole or scuba dive in leopard seal hunting grounds. Carl is a good friend of mine. He works as an assistant professor at the Department of Biology at the University of Southern Denmark in the Nord Sea Group. He's also recently joined the Danish Institute for Advanced Study as a fellow. And you'll know that I'm doing the third season of this podcast in collaboration with the Institute. In our second beer, we're going to get a little bit more in depth into Carl's research and particularly his interest in coastal ecosystems and how to protect them. We had a couple of questions on social media from our followers, and one of them led us into a conversation about the recent Netflix documentary, Sea Spiracy. Please help me spread the word about this podcast. You can do that by recommending it to a friend, leaving us a review on whatever app you're using to listen to the podcast, or giving it a share. Also consider subscribing to the podcast on your favorite podcast app or else on our website. Uh, that way you'll be able to receive the occasional blog post, some news updates and know whenever you're, whenever the latest episode is out. I'm your host, Michael McGee. Our guest is Dr. Carl Hedhard. Cheers. So, Carl, of course... Sea salt. Thanks for joining me in person here. We have very <laughs> themed crisp here, sea salt. <laughs> Let me pour you some here. Marine biologist that you are. I'm going to check the salinity. Let's check the salinity. <laughs> <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Oh, that's pretty salty. That's pretty salty? That's like Mediterranean salty. Oh. Because <laughs> you're from the Mediterranean, aren't you? Hmm. I'm originally from, uh, from the Maltese Islands. The from Malta, yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Mm-hmm. Have I, ha- I have a beer to accompany the sea salt flavored crisps, and your profession as a marine biologist. <laughs> I have here from the Holy Fridge Bar a beer called Smirk of the Dolphin, and Smirk, Smirk of the Dolphin, and <laughs> they do have I, a Smirk. Don't I had, they? I had to get this beer because it, the, you have a picture of the head of a beautiful, beautiful dolphin there. Yeah. And is that in a dolphin area? I, I don't know. I think it's dolphin friendly. <laughs> beer, dolphin friendly. At beer. least. <laughs> at least there's that. So, and it's from the Foam Brewers, and it's called the High Breaks. And it's 8.4%, so it's a good start. Wow. Cheers. Thank you, Michael. Oh. Cheers. Smirk of the dolphin. That's that's pretty good, eh? That's good. I like it. And of course, you're you're naturally into dolphins. Every marine biologist. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's Studies the fir- that's the first thing people people say. Like I, I studied marine biology, but the, oh, marine biology, oh, like dolphins and whales. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. There is, and and yes, a lot of it is is it can be even more interesting. In my yeah. <laughs> and we're we're going to go. View. We're going to get on to talk about that a bit later on, and your specific interests. But before that, I want to talk about. Talk about uh, travel, because I know that your work has brought you to many interesting places. Whenever we first met, it was about 2012. I just moved to yeah. Denmark to start my master's in marine science. And at that time, you were a couple of years into your study already. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think whenever I arrived in Denmark, you were already in Greenland. Yeah, yeah. Was so that- I was living in Greenland for, for 18 or well, close to 18 months, a year and a half. Uh, as part of my as part of my PhD, I think we we met whenever I was asking you some advice because I then went on to go to Greenland and live there for half a year during my my master thesis and j- loved the the country <laughs> just fell in love with it. It's, it's I've never been anywhere like that. It's just absolutely beautiful. Me too. Yeah, I was really impressed. And I guess one day you'll have to tell your guests about <laughs> your listeners about your experiences in Greenland. The first thing I remember is is the, the taste of the air. I never, yeah. I never smelled anything like it. You know, it was, it was so crisp and pure. It would also meant that if if you smelt some kind of impurity, like you were going in for a beer on a Friday night, you could smell the smokers <laughs> a long way before they they actually came to you. Yeah. But um, well, there's a lot of fresh air over there. Yeah, 
What what were you doing? So it was, it was part of my it was part of my um, PhD. I at the time we had just established a new um, f a facility at at SDU um, using a part particular method um, that lets us sort of study ecosystems in in new ways, and um, in particular looking at um, aquatic processes, so processes going on in the fjords around Greenland, and trying to figure out. You know, things like uh, photosynthesis rates throughout the year. Naturally, the, the seasonality in Greenland, Greenland is really extreme, right? You get, and in the Arctic in general, um, you get sort of these extreme high light periods in spring and summer. And then in winter, it's just, well, it's just dark for, for a period of the year. It, it's dark around the clock or else it's bright around the clock. Exactly. So it goes through these two extremes. And, and I think one of one of the interesting questions we wanted to address with that research is is how do these the plant communities living in shallow waters around Greenland respond to these conditions or do they respond like we do uh, <laughs> just then, sleep more <laughs> yeah sleep more in the in the dark and uh, be more active in the in that's, the summer that's that's one part to it but we we also um we also saw that there was quite some activity in winter as well which was which was somewhat surprising. So they they adjust they adjust their performance in a way their their photosynthetic capabilities in winter so that they're more efficient at um, capturing sunlight and at making energy to you know to to create create energy to to carry them through the winter. And this was quite interesting because for a while, you know, it, the assumption was that there's nothing really going on in winter. You know, things are just asleep. But um, in reality, we, we could see that there is, you know, life does does carry on under very low. Life. Would you say life finds a way? Life finds a way <laughs> yeah. um, in, in, in winter in the Arctic as well. Yeah. So you were in Nook, the big smoke uh, in, in uh, Greenland uh, at about that time. But I know you went to the North Pole as well. Isn't that true? Yeah. Yeah, I went. That was that was actually in 2012 as well. Yeah. So so I went to the North Pole aboard um, a big research vessel, an icebreaker. And we left from, from Norway and made our way past Valbard, kept going all the way up to the North Pole, and then came back. And um, in, the, in the summer? This was in summer. In summer, yeah. In summer. It also happened to be the summer with the lowest sea ice extent. So, you know, the extent of sea ice in the Arctic is like one of the key measures of of climate change almost right we see it in the news all the time that the, the sea ice extent in summer is shrinking and um this this summer had a record low and the idea was that we would go there and we would study all the processes associated to to the reduced ice pack um, to try figure out what's going on and what what was going on then in that, in that particularly unique year it's um so one of one of the interesting results that we saw is that um, so so the ice pack acts very much as an almost upside down garden. So first of all, the Arctic Ocean is quite it has these large shelf areas that are very shallow, but the the central parts of it are quite deep. They go to about four thousand meters, and then you have this you know thin film of ice on the surface, right? That is in and of itself is an entire ecosystem. So there will be so sunlight that penetrates through the ice, sustains growth of photosynth photosynthetic organisms living on the underside of the ice. And this forms together with uh, plankton in the water column, the basis of the food chain in the Arctic. And what we saw that year that was quite striking was that large clumps of this photosynthetic matter these sort of ice algal aggregates, we call them, because there was so much that are usually attached to the underside of the ice, um, because there was so much ice melt, a lot of them ended up being deposited directly into the deep sea, down to several kilometers. And so they were, in a way, they were nourishing a whole ecosystem uh, several kilo kilometers below the surface. And what was really interesting about this this discovery is that it really shows you how connected uh, parts of the ecosystem are. So stuff that's happening at, at the surface of the ocean is impacting, you know, the ecosystem down to the greatest depths in the ocean.
Oh, okay. So there's both, uh, if you, if I could put it in more simplistic terms, a positive and a negative there for the communities at the at the surface of the water for the sea ice communities. It, it's a it's a bad thing that sea ice extent is is being reduced in the summertime and it's being reduced year after year uh, because of global warming. Uh, but then you're saying that other communities can benefit from from the fallout from that. It's it it could be so. There is in general an increase in primary production in the Arctic Ocean. So we're seeing more phytoplankton growth. Um, I suppose if you have less ice, that'll that by far sort of removes the habitat for ice algae and and other organisms that live their life cycle on the ice, right? Like seals and polar bears and all the sort of things that we like. Um, but I think the best way to describe it is that there is going to be a shift. There's going to, or there, there are you know changes occurring in mm -hmm. the Arctic that are going to change. Um, the ecosystem in, in quite fundamental ways. Did you make it to the to the actual North Pole? We, we, I, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so so the, I the was... true North Pole, not the magnetic North Pole, because the magnetic it's... North Pole is somewhere in Canada. At it the is. Moment. Yeah. So the true North Pole. Um, so <clears throat> the ship, I believe, the ship made it until about 135 kilometers from the North Pole. We're really hoping, naturally, to get the ship all the way uh, to, to the to the North Pole, but it didn't happen. Um, and the reason for that, as far as far as I understand, is because there was quite a lot of snow on the ice. So it, m maybe you might think that it's, it's hard for an icebreaker to break through ice. Actually, it's not it's not it's not the hardest thing. The hardest thing is the, if there's a lot of snow on the surface and that co that causes a lot of friction on the bow of the ship. So mm. we actually couldn't go all the way to the North Pole. But I was lucky enough to get on a helicopter that was passing over the North Pole during that expedition. So this was a big ship, right? It had two helicopters. And some of the uh, sea ice um, physicists wanted to measure the thickness of the ice at the North Pole. So I, I got the, um, you know, I got under the passenger seat and, and we made it there. And yeah, it was it was a pretty incredible sight that year. How, how was the feeling to, to be at the top of the world? <laughs> <laughs> it was really it was it was really surreal. Um, it's so usually when when they do these sort of trips, so these trips happen every few years, I guess. And when they get to the North Pole, there's usually a race that people do around the world. <laughs> right? so it's you've, like, been, you've been literally around the world. <laughs> you've been you, you, you do a little, um, you know, a kilometer or whatever race around around the North Pole. So you've gone around the world. Um, we couldn't do that, but it was it was really surreal in other ways. I think the most striking thing was how little ice there actually was. You know, you're up there in the North Pole, you just think it's just a frozen wonderland, right? And it's it's not. It's just full of full of um, melt ponds. And uh, but it, it was a fascinating sight. It was really yeah. surreal to think that we were so far up north, and I was in a helicopter flying over the sea ice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was definitely one to remember. Well, whenever you're talking about the, the health of the ice, you're talking about uh, the, the thickness of it. Because if it's very thick, then it hasn't been melted for for many years. How, how thick was the ice at, ice at the North Pole? A lot of it, I think, was was about a meter. That's not thick. that's that's maybe one year's worth of uh... exactly. So it's the sort of ice that would that would melt in summer, probably. Wow. And then and then f um, form again in winter. Uh, the the malt, what we call multi-year ice, so ice that has survived several cycles of of thaw, is um, there's very little of that left, and it's mostly focused around northern Canada. So it's in 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 the you know in the central Arctic, there's there's actually they think there's very little um, multi-year ice at all. Wow. <clears throat> well, the, the the ice does grow back every winter, but if it melts every <clears throat> every summer, then Exactly. Really, the the you know the, the 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 ice ecosystem springs to life in mm. uh, you know when the light comes back, right? But if in summer, in late summer, there's not going to be ice, then there's not going to be you know the whole ecosystem associated to to the ice pack. So naturally, that's one one concern, sort of thing about about climate change and yeah. reduce sea ice cover. Yeah. So you're you're one of the the very few people that I know, in fact, you're the only person I know that, know that has also been to uh, to Antarctica. Right, yeah. 
How did you get from Denmark to Antarctica? Yeah, so um, Antarctica is is extremely remote, right? So I think there are, are some commercial flights going to, Antar- to the peninsula in mm-hmm. Antarctica. But um, what we did is that we flew to Punta Arenas in Chile from, from here, from Denmark. And then from, from Punta Arenas, we took a military plane, like a cargo plane, one of the big sort of Hercules yeah. um, cargo planes. So we flew with the Chilean military aboard the Hercules and landed on King George Island, which is one of the first land masses you get to in Antarctica um, along the on, on the on the peninsula. And then from from King George Island, we uh, took we got onto a military ship. So we spent a few days in, on King George Island and then uh, took a, took a military ship for a few days to a small island mm-hmm. um, along the peninsula where there was the where there was a the Chilean, Chilean base. Uh, altogether, I think it took us a week to get there. <laughs> and um, wow! And our departure t- uh, eight weeks later was delayed by a further two weeks because we wanted to get uh, to gather more data. And uh, so, so naturally, you're at the me- you sort of at at the mercy of this wild weather, right? And once you get into the water to collect your your samples, you become a part of the food chain basically as well, and you're very very aware of that. Okay. What, what do you mean? Did you see some leopard seals? Yes. Uh, that was, it was actually the first, the first thing that we saw when we got to the research base was a leopard seal, you know, um, eating a penguin <laughs> in the water. And we needed to be in that water the uh, following day. How, bi- how big are these guys? I, they're, they're like meters and meters. They're massive. <laughs> they're absolutely huge. Um, so, yeah, so it, so it is an incredible place, but it's also an incredibly difficult place to to do research so, so well. how, how did you feel putting on your uh, your uh, pretty thick dry suit i imagine and, and getting in the water <laughs> yeah it, it was it was exciting it, it was exciting you know you get a, you're a little bit nervous uh because these things are huge and they're also very curious uh-huh. so it they don't necessarily need to attack you right to cause to cause harm they could just come by and give you a little peck and just you know, rip your rip your regulator hose off, uh-huh. and then you're down there at whatever twenty meters, or they just could could grab you and drag you to the surface, um, without really you know wanting to wanting to hurt you. I don't I don't think that they necessarily want to hurt you, but I think they're just you know curious and big creatures. Yeah. Um, so it's a little bit nervous, but once you fo- are w- once you focus on your tasks, the things you need to do at the bottom, you get it done. You know, there's someone. Um, in a rib on the surface looking out for leopard seals and 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 if they do see something then they would you'd usually like bang two two metal rods together at the surface mm-hmm. and you, we should be able to hear that down at the bottom so the the the, the fascinate like there are a lot of fascinating things about antarctica but but one of the things is that it's permanently cold right so the the waters when we were there in summer we're only about one and a half degrees C. Mm-hmm. So, but life flourishes there, right? We see a huge abundance of animals. Um, it really takes your breath away when you see, you know, thousands of penguins, or um, you know, tens of humpback whales. Or what? What did the thousands of penguins smell like? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I've wasn't... never smelt thousands of penguins, so I'm really yeah. Curious. We were we were actually living living among them for 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 several weeks, so I, I got a I, I don't know I must have gotten you know at, uh, used to it, but <laughs> it's I, all I know is that it certainly got worse when they had their their pup when they had their babies, you know when they had um, when there were little penguins that were just sort of pooping all over the place, uh, <laughs> but they eat fish right, so you can probably imagine that it's not. It's not that pleasant. Yeah. Yeah, I eat fish, and yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, what were we doing in the Antarctica? A lot of the work we did there is basically just describing the habitats and the ecosystems. So there was part of the work that dealt with um, just collecting samples, taking photos, because 
for if for this part of Antarctica, there wasn't even an accurate bathymetric map. We didn't really even know the depth. Yeah. You know, before before we really went there and so mapped you, it you're, out. So you're you're like a proper pioneer and adventure. A, pro- in a, a proper in a, pioneer. <laughs> At least so, some of the data there is some data, but it's from from decades ago when they didn't have you know the modern tools we have today. So I think I I think you know a lot of what we did was actually just trying to describe these ecosystems to set the record right so that there will be one record and and from there and um then we can do sort of subsequent uh you know through subsequent visits we can see whether the ecosystem changes or whether it stays the same over time and um so part of the work we did we were mapping out the seafloor we we were doing a lot of diving taking samples identifying um organisms and then there was also part, another part of our of our work that we were there to do specifically was the these carbon flux um, measurements. So we wanted to figure out whether the seafloor around Antarctica was a net you could say a net source or a net sink of CO two. That 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 could be one way one way to put it. But this also has important implications for the ecosystem. So if we can figure out how much primary production, for instance, is taking place in these areas, we could then um, figure out how important the seafloor could be for sort of sustaining, for nourishing the communities of um, of organisms we see in the waters over there, which range from, you know, that's, that's them at the bottom of the food chain, right? The, the photosynthetic production. Mm-hmm. And from there, we see, you know, you know several... Um, layers within the within the food chain all the way up to um, the scary leopard seals so without a, a healthy sea sea bottom without a healthy uh, grip of algae you don't have any leopard seals you don't have any humpback whales yeah that's 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 part of the part of the puzzle is yeah. figuring out where this prime this photosynthesis this primary production comes from and how much of it comes from the water mm-hmm. in terms of the plankton and how much is is on the sea floor Okay. So that's that's part of the puzzle we're trying to solve. One one of the really interesting things about Antarctica is that despite there being despite it being very cold and very like extreme, see, you know, se- seasonally, uh, we do see really high primary production rates, and this is required, right? For I mean, if you just look at the sheer numbers of animals of large animals on Antarctica, they need to be eating all the time, right? They're eating krill. They're eating fish. They're eating all sorts of things, and those, and that level of the food chain is then in turn sustained through, largely through sort of um, primary production through ph- photosynthetic production. So um, that was really our job to try to figure out how important the sea floor was for contributing to uh, primary production in this in this system. Greenland, or, no, sorry, the Arctic or Antarctic? Which was your favorite to visit? The, the most sort of impressive place was Antarctica, yeah. for sure. Yeah, hands down. It's just the... And, I, I mean, you must have gotten some similar impressions when you were in Greenland of the space. It's just, it's kind of hard to put a scale bar on it, mm-hmm. you know? You're just seeing these huge glaciers and, and, and mountains, and there, your eye is sort of looking for something to put, you know, to... to, to compare it to yeah. but um the 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 really impressive thing about antarctica is despite it being like a huge continent there's very little space along the coast because the glaciers keep coming out all the way to the water and in some cases on the water as well and so there are just these tiny slithers of land um, and that's it and you know these these small bits of land are just then packed with thousands of penguins mm-hmm. So it's it's a it's a very impressive place. It's it's just the scale of it is just it, it's it's hard to make sense of in a way. Yeah, yeah. But one thing I found very humbling in in Greenland was the was how fierce the the weather could be, just out of the blue. Mm-hmm. You, you could some days you could go outside, you know, blue skies. There's no wind. And you could go out in a t-shirt, but then sometimes the wind picked up where you couldn't you couldn't walk. Like it blew you on your ass, and you had to like crawl to the nearest post, and pull yourself up. And you're just like humbled at the at how fierce it could be. 
yeah yeah it's there, there is there is always that that sense you know that you need to be aware of things around you and you know when you're working on the ice in the in the central arctic there are polar bears right around you you know they're there and it's also extre- it can be extremely foggy uh-huh so yeah. you know there are people you know it's it is it is a well coordinated um expedition overall there'll be people on polar bear guard both on the bridge and the ship and also on the ice but at some points you just think you know a, 40, a polar bear can run at like 40 whatever kilometers per hour mm-hmm. and um <laughs> i mean what what you know and if it's if it's foggy and visibility is is not that that so there's there's always this inherent danger but i think you just learn to to cope with it and you just put all the measures possible in place mm-hmm. so that everyone feels safe and um, you can get the job done basically I'll, I'll tell you the story about uh, about Greenland so so uh, <laughs> it, yeah in Greenland it, it, there's not a lot of not a lot of fresh vegetables or it takes a, it takes a lot to import food so people do hunt and people hunt because for, for conservation reasons the reindeers can be so abundant in the in the summertime, that if there's a bad winter following, there was, there was so many reindeers eating all the vegetation that they can't live through the winter, and then the whole population crashes. So they, there's a coding, or a hunting quota for reindeer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Interesting. And I, and I said that for anybody listening who's against against hunting, it, it's 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 a sport. I find it very fun, but it's also it's something that uh, that's done for the the good of the reindeer population. But we we went into the fjords. <laughs> This on the the second last day of hunting season, like a long way up a fjord next next to it, took like eight hours to sail in there, and and went uh, went hiking up up the mountains, in search of reindeer. Found found a couple just before sunset. And uh, ended up taking them, taking them back back to the. Sorry, I forgot a part of the story. We took a a little rubber boat the whole way up a very long freshwater river. <laughs> By this stage, it was getting dark. The sun just went down. We got back to our little rubber boat at the end of the river, the river, but the river was frozen. So we're thinking, okay, not good. We're, we're, we're <laughs> it's a long way back to the to the main boat. Uh, maybe we can wait until the next high tide so the salt water can come in and defrost this this freshwater um, ice. So then we got ready to, to buckle down for a few hours underneath the survival blanket. The the lady Christine who was taking taking me in in hunting, she the whole day she was just talking about how how uh, dangerous polar bears were, how they they wouldn't do anything with the our rifles and the bullets in the rifles, how it would just make them more angry. And uh, and there's usually a polar bear in this area uh, at this time of the year every year. <laughs> so we're sitting there with a couple of dead. Reindeer, <laughs> <laughs> perfect polar bear food. Exactly, uh, it's it's minus eight degrees. We're in a survival blanket that I ended up ripping at some point. We're looking up at the beautiful aurora borealis, uh, which is gorgeous. But you're distracted by all the rustling <laughs> in the vegetation around you. Eventually, the high tide came in. Didn't do anything to the to the to the ice. We made it back to the to the our proper boat. Uh, by this stage, the fr- the salt water had frozen. And we had an eight-hour trip back to <laughs> back to the place we were living. So we're, we're sitting at the front of the boat, just slowly grinding against the ice, and that horrible. Uh, yeah. And we're sitting at the front just in case uh, the the ice ripped the the fiberglass apart. So then we could go to the back of the boat and lift the hole above the water. Fog <laughs> just came out of nowhere, just out of absolute nowhere. There's fog descends, and then in a place where they never see icebergs we started to see icebergs just a few meters from the boat <laughs> and then uh, many hours later we managed to get up get back to the back to where we were staying and and uh i think we had a whiskey then <laughs> <laughs> you think <laughs> yeah yeah it's um it is it is one of those, those places where things can change really quickly mm-hmm. um and i've i've had s- sort of similar experiences where we've been out on a boat on the boats and um you know there's just flat calm and um then suddenly you know beautiful sailing conditions and then out of nowhere the tide changes brings in a load of ice from icebergs and suddenly you're caught in between this 
in 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 between this sort of f- entire fields of of ice, mm-hmm. and you can't really do anything about it but just wait it out, basically. Um, yeah, it's it's the same with with um, with bad weather too, right? And and it, it it happened in Antarctica as well. You tend to get these really strong winds called catabatic winds that just kind of force their way down mm. um, down the mountains and 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 yeah. Wreak, can wreak havoc if you're not yeah if you're not careful so you know you're constantly watching the weather report right and and i don't know what 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 you <laughs> you, you guys i guess were too far yeah too far gone by that point it wasn't just the plan it back. wasn't the yeah. plan to stay there for the night <laughs> <laughs> so b- before you continue carl uh, could you could you describe in in simple terms a carbon cycle so a, a carbon cycle is um, is one of the many what we call biogeochemical cycles on Earth, and and it concerns sort of the movement and the transformation we call it the flux of chemical elements um, such as carbon between living and non-living forms. When I talk about carbon the carbon cycle within the the context of my research. It's usually looking at uh, the balance between photosynthesis, which is the production of living biomass, uh, living plant biomass from CO2, and its reverse process, which is called respiration. And um, one thing I guess to realize is that coastal zones are really hotspots for these processes. So that's one of one of the reasons why my research focuses on on coastal zones. The carbon cycle in particular is, is very interesting because carbon is the currency of ecosystems. So the transformation and the flux of carbon between different forms is what makes Earth capable of sustaining life. Um, one example of this, for instance, could be that, you know, living matter from the time of the dinosaurs 100 million years ago um, that was buried in the Earth uh, was you know dug up now today yeah. um, as as oil, and it was burned to generate energy, and then it enters the atmosphere as CO two, right? Mm-hmm. And the CO two is then taken up by plants during photosynthesis, and then it is then broken down again back to CO two by microbes feeding on decaying matter. So it's these these sort of cycles that are that I think are really interesting and fascinating to study. That that's a a, a gorgeous picture. A hundred million years ago, you have sunlight energy coming, hitting some uh, marine algae, that took the energy from the sun, took CO two and water, and made sugar, and then it was buried. A hundred million years later, we dig it up, and we use that stored sunlight. Basically, it is stored sunlight. Mm. For, for our own energy purposes. And then that goes into the cycle again, and that stored sunlight goes round and round in the cycle. That ancient energy. I think that's right. a, a beautiful story. And we're, yeah. b- we're burning, burning dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's, um, it, sho- it shows you that, you know, these cycles are, are linked, right? We don't exist in um, isolation of, of the earth. And, and that's where, you know, what we eat and where we get our energy is very much linked to these processes as well. I find it very uh, distracting to think of where have all, say, the individual at- atoms <laughs> in our food or our beer, where have they been throughout history? You know, <laughs> yeah. at one point they were they were born in stars, you know, and, and where have they passed through on their way to our, on their way to our uh, smirk of the dolphin beer? <laughs> Cheers, Carl. Cheers. Mm. Oh yeah. Do another beer? Sure. So our next beer, Carl, uh, I bought it because it says the word greenhouse on it. So that's very appropriate for our our discussion there. So. Mm. This is from in Greenhouse Imperial Lager. Conditioned on American oak. Very nice. Whatever that means. Uh, <laughs> it's from the uh, the brewing company Evil Twin. Do you know the story behind Evil Twin? Ed, Was he bad? <laughs> well, uh, Mickler is probably one of the most known beer, like a 
you could you could call it a microbrewery, but it's really global now, and they're they do fantastic beer. But the the brother and it, the guy Mickler had a bit of an argument a while ago, so the brother went off to start his own beer company, and it's called Evil Twin. Oh, and it's it's just, just as nice as Mickler. There you go, Carl. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. So photosynthesis is the creation of sugars from sunlight and then respiration is burning those sugars for energy. Uh, can you describe scenarios where these are out of balance with each other? For example, whenever there's more photosynthesis than respiration or also whenever there's more respiration mm-hmm. compared to photosynthesis. Yeah, sure. So so that's like one of, one of the big questions in the ocean, I would say, is to try to figure out this balance exactly. Um, because... This, so, so whenever you measure these, these processes, uh, you're doing it over a specific area of the seafloor, typically within a certain habitat. Um, and there are, you know, like, like ecosystems on land, there are many different habitats in the coastal ocean as well. Anyone who has been sort of snorkeling around uh, Denmark, um, you know, if you're brave enough or, uh, <laughs> <laughs> or other places. Yeah, there are would, other places. There are other places. <laughs> You would have seen that, um, you know, you would have seen things like seagrasses probably that just look like meadows just just on land. Um, you probably would have seen some some mussels, some you know some uh, these these shellfish on the seafloor as well. And one of the questions that I try to uh, to address in my research is to try to figure out the balance between photosynthesis and respiration in these habitats. And the reason why that's really interesting is because it it tells you something about how something important about how these habitats function. So, for instance, in one one of our recent projects, we looked at these processes in many different habitats in in the Baltic Sea. And what we deduced from that work was that um, mussel reefs, for instance, which are quite widespread, they respire much more than they they photosynthesize. So that means that there's an imbalance there and they need to somehow get this organic matter from somewhere else. And the way that they accomplish that is that they're really good at filtering water, right? So they filter huge volumes of water, they get all the plankton in the water out of it, and then they use that organic matter to sort of fuel their metabolism. Mm -hmm. At the other end of the spectrum, we have um, what we call macroalgal beds. They're sort of these brown macroalgae that you see when you're walking along the coast they grow on rocks so and and what they do is they 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 have their whole they have a hole fast they attach to the rocks and then they grow up vertically into the water column and harvest uh, the sunlight like that and photosynthesize and what we see from our measurements is that they photosynthesize much more than they respire and what this means essentially is that they can accumulate much more carbon and depending on whether they can they can store the carbon in the habitat or not which in this case they can't because they're on rock it cannot accumulate in the sediments beneath them uh, the carbon gets exported to surrounding habitats and and fuels other parts of the ecosystem we, we've uh, we've talked about the importance of these coastal habitats but how can we protect these coastal habitats yeah, so this is being done through conservation and through a lesser and to a lesser extent through restoration. Um, when it comes to restoration, there are several success stories from Denmark and from further afield that illustrate how habitat degradation can be reversed through active restoration. However, it is a laborious process, and it, it doesn't you know it 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 wouldn't apply um, everywhere. So, for instance, in the Mediterranean seagrasses accumulate substantial amounts of carbon in their sediments right it's it's one of the one of the things they do and they they store it over thousands of years um however say if uh if a if a small boat comes and anchors to the seafloor it um can disrupt the habitat and cause sort of thousands of years worth of damage and there are different conservation strategies for this, because naturally the key here is conservation, right? We don't want to lose all that carbon that's been stored in the sediments and that habitat that's been constructed over so many years. And there are some interesting conservation strategies. So one of them is that um, 
Some countries have designated these habitats as UNESCO World Heritage Sites because seagrasses are one of the longest lived organisms on Earth. How, so how they, old? Well, there are some estimates that they could be 200,000 years old. Holy smokes. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so, so another um, way, I think, to, is, is, is to increase financial incentive as well. So there are some um, incentives such as carbon crediting which is kind of a, a, a new and, and maybe strange thing, but, but it can actually help conservation efforts. And um, with respect to barriers towards conservation, naturally there are, there are, many, different, there, there are many different barriers, but um, I think that one perspective that's often not talked about um, is, is the issue with what we call gag lawsuits in Europe. Which, uh, which are also called, uh, the proper name is Strategic Lawsuits Against pu Public Participation, or SLAPS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> SLAPS, yeah, because that's what it is, essentially. So these are used extensively, right, um, as, as a form of harassment, actually, to, to, to silence individuals and organizations by eating up their time and money. So it's, it's, it's lib libel uh -huh. uh, suits, basically. Uh, however, um, last year, so, so the, the whole idea is that there are people who are, um, you know, whistleblowers, maybe holding people to account, or maybe just watchdogs, you know, journalists releasing a certain, uh, writing an article about, about it. And what they can find often is that, is that organizations with, with vested interests, whether it's a company or a politician, um, then suddenly file these lawsuits against them that's meant to just intimidate them, mm -hmm. right, to silence them. And it's it's actually a really seri serious issue. But um, and last year, Greenpeace got together with more than a hundred other NGOs, and they published a policy paper. And um, what many people are hoping is that this will result in the EU implementing a series of anti-slap legislation. So to make it harder, <laughs> which sounds kind of which sounds kind of funny, but it's 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 actually really important for people driving these causes. Uh -huh. Um, you know, not to not to encounter any hurdles and and to be able to to speak and have a debate about it. So, so for example, if you want to to uh, to to have some kind of I don't know, maybe a, a protest or do a campaign uh, against, say, eating meat. Yeah, you can't get slapped. You can get slapped. You can get slapped at the moment, but but this legislation would make it possible that you cannot get slapped. Or it would make it <laughs> it would make it harder. For, for people to to open these these because in many countries there is um, it takes very little to open to like open one of these libel cases a small cost and then um, you know the, the the other party needs to respond to that and they need to pay you know to to and, and, and formulate their response and if they don't then they're just guilty by admission so, so. so you go up against Nestle or coca cola yeah. for their uh, for their carbon budget they're going to shut you down immediately. They they they'll pro they might try. Yeah, yeah. But it could be anything. It could be down to an individual. You know mm -hmm. who 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 you're. You know what you're proposing. They don't really like that. So so they just mm -hmm. slap you. Yeah, and then you you don't have the 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 budget to match their this exactly. multinational organization. Exactly. So so um and, and this is obviously hindering conservation, right? Because yeah. because people often speak up against certain activities that are damaging ecosystems. Yeah. But and then they're muzzled in this way. So that's 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 awful. Yeah. But but but, but but this this is uh there are people working to prevent this happening in the EU. Yeah, absolutely. It was last year, I think, um that you know, Greenpeace got together with all these NGOs mm -hmm. and proposed these specific ways for how this can be yeah. largely sort of reduced. Well, that, well, that that that's excellent because because it seems to be something that's against free speech. It is, yeah, it is. So we live in hope. As an ecologist, you're studying connections in nature. Uh, I'm putting a, a budget onto that. Uh, but you recently joined the Danish Institute for Advanced Study. Uh, I'm doing this season of the podcast with with the institute, and I'm a big mm -hmm. fan of the idea behind the institute because it is cross disciplinary connections so you have people such as yourself marine scientists meeting historians meeting health scientists meeting engineers and just talking together basically to see what kind of what kind of ideas you can come up with which is fantastic because back whenever i was studying biology 
you just we just hung out with a bunch of biologists, <laughs> which was great. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it it would have been probably a lot more richer to 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 hang out with people from the humanities, from business and social science, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so, how, have you been working with anybody uh, outside your field of marine science? Yeah. So. Um my work so far has very much focused on on ocean processes. Um, but so in, in marine science, and in, in probably in other sciences and other disciplines, too, we often think of cross disciplinary cross, cross disciplinary studies, you know, as a marine biologist working with a biochemist or a geologist, um, which in, in and of themselves, these collaborations can be can be really uh, fruitful and move the field forwards, right. Mm-hmm. But what I think Diaz, um, does in a way it's a more accurate reflection of society as a whole because it encourages you to think of the multiple dimensions of your research Mm -hmm. um, that could be of interest and um, so naturally my my core expertise is in studying ocean processes and i will use my my position in dias um, to build a research team uh, focusing on the effects of of these extreme events uh, the storms and heat waves on ecosystems um, I, you know, I'm excited about this topic. I think it's the next sort of research frontier within my, my field of study. But I'm also keen to participate within the within the Diaz environment. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm in discussions with researchers at the architecture and engineering facil- uh, faculties, for instance, to explore ways for how to enhance biodiversity and ecosystem services within urban environments. So. Okay. Yeah, most people live in cities. Most cities are close to the sea. And there are, you know, you know there's an increased need to to sort of replace, to, to rethink about how we design cities and urban environments to bring biodiversity into these these places as well. So you, you mentioned uh, ecosystem services there. Seagrass communities, they, they, they're, they're, they're great. <laughs> we've agreed that they're great. Are great but are, are, are they great um, just ecologically or, or can, can we do we have do we have a use, use for them like like grass above above uh, above uh, the ground we, we use that we use that for, for grazing for feed, feeding cattle we can we can use that we can use uh, grass above ground to uh, thatch our roofs if we were from the olden days yeah. <laughs> or the countryside of Denmark mm-hmm. is there a use that we have for seagrasses um, yeah, so 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 it, we're we're thinking more and more about sustainability, right, and about our need to source new materials um, that are sustainable, that contribute to a certain a, a circular type of of economy, right? And um, historically in Denmark, it's it, it's it's quite interesting that seagrasses have been used uh, for for construction in the past. Um, there are some houses that are like three hundred years old still have seagrass um on you know as thatch on the roof. I didn't know that they had they used seagrass. I thought that was uh above water grass. Yeah, um well in some places like on Leso for instance, mm-hmm. the the island um in Denmark, it it has been used. And in fact it it's it's it was used quite a lot. So after the after the autumn storms, right, the stuff washes up on the shore. They would li- sort of spread it out in the fields. Uh, the rains would wash away all the all the salt and all, all sorts of other things, and then they would just use it. They would just use it for insulation, for you know roofing. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, naturally, after the the seagrass pandemic, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the great the plague, the great seagrass plague, <laughs> yeah, the great seagrass plague. Um, it it wasn't a reliable, you know, source of of material anymore. So, and and then there were all the inventions that came after that, and and you know it it, it wasn't the the best material to use anymore. But but nowadays, um, we're looking more and more towards this the, towards um, you know sourcing new materials that are more sustainable. Mm-hmm. And I think you know seagrasses could be could be one option there where you can extract you know you could you could use the fibers for seagrass. So with very little processing. You know, much less than 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 hemp, for instance. You could just use these fibers that are naturally fire and rot resistant and and pest resistant, um, and make some sort of materials out of them. So so I'm also in discussions with with uh, material scientists and architects at SDU mm-hmm. to um, to see how we could use these sort of materials uh, for construction in particular. 
So we actually have a couple of questions, Carl, uh, from the internet. Maybe you've heard about it. The internet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we we have one um, from uh, uh, Mikkel uh, Hagman uh, on Instagram. What are your views on commercial fishing and its impact on the ocean? And does fishing for sport have an impact as well? Mm. I'm not, I must admit, I'm not an expert on fishing, but I guess, um, you know, the, 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 the impact of commercial fishing were really sort of uh, brought forward in the, in the recent documentary, right? That, that sea spiracy. In sea, yeah, sea spiracy. Mm-hmm. That's what it's called. I watched it. You did? And, and it was, uh, have you watched it? I did actually. Yeah, well, a few I, days ago. The immediate impact for me was, well, first of all, it, it, he's, he's, he's. I'm sure that he's uh, exaggerating here, but I still, it hit me. It hit me very mm. emotionally, thinking, okay, I can't eat any fish anymore. This is uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is really quite. Uh, I, I'm haunted by the images uh, that were shared on the on the on the documentary, but uh, then I went looking into some of the quotes that were used for example there's going to be no fish in the oceans by 2048 that was a paper published in 2006 and very quickly the authors retracted it and it, since then there's been a lot of papers to say that okay that, that is not the case and if you're looking up information for a documentary like that you're going to be able to see that this 2006 paper has been retracted and you're going to see how many other scientists have denied those claims but still he included it in the documentary mm-hmm. and and that really that i i find that he of course he had a he had an agenda and he wanted to get he basically wanted to get people to stop eating fish but because he misused science the more you misuse science the more mistrust you grow in the general public in science yeah but because mm-hmm. it, science is the only way that we have of observing the world and using data to rule out mm-hmm. your bias or your emotional connection to the subject. Right. And and I think, I mean, okay, so I, I have mixed feelings about it uh, as well. But um, I, I guess one consideration is, okay, so what does Sea Spirit, what does this um, documentary represent? And to me... As a marine scientist, it's more, I think it's, to me, it's more of an artistic expression of this person, this individual who's sort of, who loves the oceans, right? He's, he's concerned about the plight of the oceans. Mm-hmm. So he makes a movie about the ocean as seen from his perspective. And this movie makes it onto the uh, Net- Netflix top 10 list, right? Which yeah. is, which is obviously a, a great achievement. Um, I, I am pre- convinced that the issues he discusses are real. So they are real issues. And um, from what I understand, people mostly take issue with the statistics that are being presented. And yeah, some of them sounded, you know, I had sort of, I thought some of them sounded sounded uh, incorrect as well, mm-hmm. or maybe they were misinterpreted. And certainly with the solution they sort of offer at the end, which is just, you know, to stop eating fish and all that sort of thing. The, the reality is, of course, much more, much more gray. And I think we should, I think it's important to talk about all of that. Like, you know, the, the statistics, you know, how, when do we expect fish to run out? But I think it shouldn't overshadow the overall goal, um, which is, I suppose, to bring to light ocean issues and to try to influence policy through debate. And one thing I think that we can probably both agree on is that people have been talking about these issues much more in recent days than mm-hmm. they have in the past year, for instance. Yeah. Right? Um, so I, I think in a way the documentary succeeds in, in doing that, in, in, in bringing these issues to light. And um, I think one thing to remember as well and 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 maybe I'm being a bit a bit controversial, but so if we if people like 
like myself, like you, you know, we're we're both interested in the ocean. We 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 love the ocean. We want to see it, you know, prosper, whatever, into the future. We want, we hope for maybe sustainable fisheries. Um, I think whenever we kind of take a stand about, against against that, in a way, we're you know we're playing into the hands of perhaps the people who are damaging the oceans. Mm -hmm. You know, so 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 I, I'm not personally. I'm not too concerned about it. Mm -hmm. I I think it's actually, it actually succeeds in bringing a lot of these these issues to light. I've been talking to my you know to my parents about eating salmon, and so, you know my mom asked me like, is there really you know is there really a color chart for salmon <laughs> and, yeah. and all these sort of things and and oh do they really throw away so many so many dead dead fish and all that sort of stuff. So I think there are, it it has. It has certainly stimulated debate, and I think that's only a good thing. But it has stimulated the debate. But he he was brittle in his depiction, especially some of the scientists in the film. They were maybe quoted. You could see them for a couple of sentences, mm. and you know that uh, the conversation was a lot longer. There's no sentences. It's like me, me. Uh, we, we've been talking for for an hour now, and then taking two minutes of it and using that. You know, it, mm -hmm. I, I, I could put you out, out of. I could uh, I could misquote you. Yeah, that's the exactly. beauty of the long form podcast. <laughs> you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's an honest media source, but I. It it did appeal to the people. People that come from countries like Western Europe and North America, you know, they they could say, okay, I'll not eat fish. I'll just eat my my quinoa and soybean salad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a, that's a luxury to be able to do that. It is. I mean, my my advice would be like, you know, don't look to these sort of documentaries to tell you what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. Right? There are thousands of people worldwide. That, mm -hmm. that are experts on the topic mm -hmm. that work day in day out to help you make these choices you know if if you want to eat more sustainably there are sustainable seafood guides mm -hmm. right right that give you a lot of the details mm -hmm. uh, about that particular fish uh, you know fishery yeah. or that activity so um i don't know perhaps people are reading a little bit too much into it i'm yeah. not sure i i well, i just see it as a as as i said it's it's more like they're expression of of concern you know well well what i what i would hope for would be that it would inspire people to then go to the source it would infar, exactly. inspire people to to do a little bit more research and it's it certainly does that i think yeah. you know i think i think people are being more aware of of the source nowadays mm -hmm. and i've had several friends ask you know who are, who are not marine scientists um ask me you know is that true you know is that real is that really an issue and and then you can have that debate with them, you know, mm. and they can get they can get better information. So. Yeah. Well, this is what we want to do with science beers. We want to inspire <laughs> science driven uh, or data driven debate uh, in bars once the bars open, and they're going to open very soon. If you're listening in the future and the bars are open, there was a point in 2021, 2020, where there was a plague <laughs> and we couldn't go to the bars, which is why myself and Card here we're sitting in a we're sitting in actually in a music studio. There's a there's a drum kit over there. There's a piano and loads of basses around here and uh, we're drinking cans <laughs> but we hope we sure hope to be back in a bar someday soon Carl uh, we have another question from uh, Claudia Campagnol what would you share with non-marine biologists that would make us feel this is kind of linked with the previous question that would make us feel like we need need to change our behaviour uh, I, I, I guess to, to protect the marine environment uh, and she says especially considering that you've been to both poles and most people uh, listening to the podcast, including myself, have not. So, so have you saw anything in your uh, in your research expeditions around the world that you can share with us that might make us uh, think more about our our, our natural environment uh, that might make us care for it a bit more? Like one one thing I would um, consider is to think of you know if we're talking about we're just talking about seafood before right. And where that comes from, I would, you know, we we, sh we should be, we should think about that, right? We should think about where our food comes from, and um, 
exactly as 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 I sort of mentioned before in response to the to the other question I think we should we should ask more questions like where is it coming from you know use these guides if we can and employ the, the sort of the same level of criticism that we would for other foods right so if if we want to eat local you know think think of that in terms of seafood as well perhaps you know and 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 maybe look into if you're concerned about that uh look into sustainable seafood guides which are really good and and openly available um so i think that's that's the best thing i can think of um and pro- e- eating locally is really the best thing e- e- eating seasonally and locally is probably one of the best things we could do a- avocados the whole year round from south america probably yeah. not not great tiger shrimps from thailand all year round probably not great but but there's loads of delicious local vegetables here in denmark exactly or, or probably so, where you the listeners come from there's probably a lot of delicious local foods and if it's local and it's seasonal it's probably more nutritious and it's probably tastier anyway exactly that, that's 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 what i would think and that's that's what i would suggest so um yeah may, maybe be just more open you know to to trying perhaps uh fish that you just thought were oh you know just um oily and yucky and there could be delicious ways of cooking them so get uh make your kitchen into a science lab and, <laughs> yes. and, and experiment carl thanks very much for uh joining me on the science of beers podcast it's been a pleasure chatting with you thanks for having me great stuff cheers cheers well i hope you enjoyed that episode of the science of beers podcast i hope you enjoyed our our trip to the remote places around the world i would love to hear from you so please uh, follow up with a comment uh through social media or else uh, send a um, an email to science and beers at gmail.com also if you have any specific questions for Carl I can forward that on again please uh, help us promote this podcast share it with a friend share it on social media leave a review and subscribe on the scienceandbeers.com website there's a link in the description for our social media pages and Carl's social media pages I also link to some of the things that Carl mentioned in, uh, in the chat that we had I sure had fun having a beer and a chat with Carl And I hope you enjoy listening. Cheers.